Welcome everyone to the April 2022 Nats Chat. I'm Kari Reagan, moderator of Nats Chats, which are sponsored by Inside View Press and tonight co-sponsored by the Voice Foundation. So thank you, Voice Foundation, at, of which Peggy is also a representative of tonight as she has co-moderated with me in the past as their representative. I am so thrilled tonight to discuss this topic, which is near and dear to my heart, singing voice specialist controversies and collaboration. And I am equally thrilled to be joined by my esteemed guests, colleagues and friends, Peggy Baruti, Marcy Rosenberg and Lita Scarce. Thank you for joining me, ladies. Happy to be here. Thank you for inviting us. So we are the four of us. We have, have had a, many wonderful conversations this week, and we are so eager to have this collaborative uh, and authentic conversation about a, what can be a difficult subject tonight. But we want to begin by sharing a little bit of the beyond the bio, how we all came to do the, this important work that we are doing. And what I think is so interesting is that we each represent a different model. So uh, Peggy, would you like to lead us off tonight and share a little bit about your journey? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I was a singer and voice teacher and I was in my mid thirties and Dr. Sadaloff, Bob Sadaloff was my personal voice doctor. And at that time in my life, I thought to myself, you know, I, this business of working with injured voices is really interesting. And I went to Bob and I said, how do you, how do you learn how to do that? And he said, the first thing you need to do is to attend the Voice Foundation Symposium, which was in New York at the time. That's how long ago this was. So I went to my first Voice Foundation Symposium where I was exposed to um, voice science and voice research and concepts, which suddenly um, made clear to me many of the pedagogic concepts that I had learned through the years and I was very excited and I was very excited about the medical part of it. So I went back to Bob and I said, I'm really thrilled by this and I'm very interested. I didn't understand half of what I heard, but I'd like to learn more. I was very fortunate in that Bob took me under his wing and uh, sort of informally trained me and gave me the knowledge that I needed to do this work. I eventually went to work for him full time. I was his uh, uh, voice, one of his voice clinicians for 29 years until 2019 and I still receive, <clears throat> excuse me, patients from him and other uh, specialized laryngologists. So my model was one of sort of the um, piece together what you need to know about um, working with the injured voice. And I hope we'll talk more about that as we go. Uh, it, it, later on, I'll, we'll, we'll touch on that. And Peggy, um, just for clarification in this model sure. conversation, you received a salary directly from Dr. Sadaloff's I, clinic. I did. Correct? Actually, at, at some point after uh, sort of working with Bob and training under him, he offered me a position in the office and it was a full time salary position. And so that is what I took. And it's that's a little unusual. And I'm sure we'll get to this subject later on. But yeah. Um, in any private practice or university-sponsored practice, back practice, normally the voice clinicians are going to be someone who's licensed and certified so that they can bill for insurance. In my case, I was not. And it was only through the force of Bob's personality that people were willing to pay out of pocket for the singing voice work. And uh, it, it ended up being a good thing. Wonderful. And we will for delve me. into that little rabbit hole more. Marcy, mm -hmm. would you share a bit about your journey to this work? Absolutely. So not surprisingly, a slightly different path, which I suspect will be a theme among the four of us. So when I was at Peabody Conservatory doing my undergrad in voice in my <laughs> year, a couple of things happened at the same time. The first was that my um, voice teacher, Ruth Drucker, um, got me to sign up to be a normal volunteer for a study that I think it was Sandy Bishop and the laryngologist whose name I can't remember we're doing a study so I got to go and have a scope and at the same time I was taking a, a vocal pedagogy course also and so I was totally just drawn to all of the scientific aspects of voice and voice production and in, as a younger singer, I would go to my teachers with questions like, how come when I'm singing like in my head register on an e-vowel 
on an F sharp, I notice this, but if I switch to a different note or a different vowel, I so I went with really very specific questions and a lot of my earlier voice teachers weren't sure what to do with me. But um, when I saw that scope, <laughs> and that there was a job called a speech pathologist who worked with voice disorders and singers, I thought, I am, that is what I am doing. And literally within, you know, a, a month I had enrolled, you know, at Towson State to start my second bachelor's degree in speech pathology. So I, I went in only wanting really to do voice and voice disorders. I was very lucky to fall into the job that I still have 20 years later, um, right out of grad school because of my background at the time, which was more unique than it is now not as unique to have a, a dual background. Uh, and I've been at, at Michigan Medicine at the Vocal Health Center ever since, where I'm in a multidisciplinary clinic co-located with Frida Herseth and Mel Racine, who are with us as part of our voice care team on Wednesdays, where we see multidisciplinary voice, and they are um, voice professors. So they are not speech pathologists, and we are co-located under one roof on Wednesdays. And um, and we see all sorts of different kinds of patients. So that's wonderful. My... And I I'd like to hear, you're going to hear your bio too, Kari. I know you don't normally because you're a pathologist, but I'm I I think that it's appropriate for this that you also share with us your path. Thank you, Marcy. We'll have Lee to go, and then I'll I'll take it from there. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. asking. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. I just want to start out by saying. Thank you, Kari, for your, your leadership on the Nats chats and for initiating this discussion um, and for the work that you've done over so many years in, in this area. And I just, I feel really honored yeah. to be among this esteemed and august body of professionals here this evening. Um, yes, slightly different path. And I, I think that's an important thing to underscore in our discussion tonight that um, there are there are many paths to this work. Uh, like Peggy, I started out as a, a professional singer and singing teacher. I did my uh, bachelor's and master's degree in voice at Indiana University and went on to um, sing professionally in opera and concert recital and, and I taught voice as an adjunct at several colleges and universities for about 14 years uh, and then I kind of came to a point where I was sort of exploring um, doing some different things and discovered like Marcy that there was uh, that this was a part of being a, a speech pathologist and so decided to to seek a second master's degree in speech pathology and I did my prereqs at University of North Texas and then did my master's degree in speech pathology at Boston University um, doing an internship in professional voice at the Mass Eye and Ear Infirmary, which at that time was when uh, Dr. Steve Zaitels was there. And when I finished that degree, I just had the tremendous good fortune um, to be um, invited to, to Duke for my first speech pathology position. And, and from there was asked to collaborate with some of my ENT colleagues to create a voice center, a designated voice center there and that's where I've been ever since for the last hmm, uh, 16 years. And uh, our model is that the folks in our clinic who work with singers, we require that they have a background um, in an experience as singing teachers and as professional performers in addition to being speech pathologists. Wonderful. Well, so um, yes, if you, as you guys have all said, we each had our own paths. I am probably more representative of the, of the typical voice teacher who has to find their own way into this, their own training uh, through collaboration and luck for me. I had a master's from Indiana University and had just moved home from living abroad for three years. And I had been teaching those since I was 19 years old, so at full-time level. So I've taught probably 35 to 40 hours a week for nearly 40 years now. And I uh, had a student who, I just heard something in their speaking voice. I knew nothing about laryngology. I mean, this was 20 years ago now, so it was a newer field anyway, the field of laryngology. 
And um, I thought, gosh, I just wonder what's going on. And I happened to have had a student, a family whose father was a ENT, back then ENT designated voice specialist. I don't even know if he designated himself that, but he was the person in town. And I had his daughters every four years. And so I thought, gosh, I bet he would know something about this. <laughs> so I sent her and I was so lucky because Marty Nevdal, who's a, gr a great speech language pathologist and ran the University of Washington Speech and Hearing Clinic until just a few years ago, happened to be there. And I remember getting a phone call or an email from him to discuss this singer. And I just was blown away by the language, by his generosity, but the language he used, um, the anatomy and physiology. And I, I you know, I, it was just a whole new world. Um, and it was really his generosity that lured me in. And I always say, and Marty knows this, I blame him for putting me on the, on the world of a, a singing voice specialty. I blame him. So from there, he invited me to come and observe. And this collaboration with him started. Dr. Marathi eventually moved to the University of Washington and has developed this phenomenal team of clinicians that I collaborate with. And simultaneously, I was getting my doctorate at the University of Washington. But I will tell you, at my doctor, in my doctoral degree program, I was not required to take a PET class. So my last PET class was at, um, at Indiana uh, with Roy Samuelson. Lita, I bet you took it with Roy as well. We used the Appleman book, <laughs> which was very dense. I still and, have <laughs> <laughs> no wonder I wasn't interested in it back then. I mean, it's a wonderful book, right? But for a, a you know somebody who is an aspiring opera singer, that who needs to know anatomy and physiology? I had no interest in that, right? That's what the the great irony of my life. Anyway, so that's how the collaboration for me started, and from there, I really was scrappy and went out and got my own training uh, as much as I could, and eventually I was invited. I uh, um, submitted an abstract to speak at uh, Nats about working with injured singers because, again, I was so naive. I didn't know this was a thing. And I was very luckily put on a panel or uh, in a presentation with Lita and Karen Wicklund, the late Karen Wicklund. And Karen was just took me under her wing and was generous. And so I said, I think I need to go back and become a speech pathologist. She said, no. Very, and we'll talk about this later. Very little of that has to do with voice. I'm going to start this training that really is for the voice teacher, and this is what they need to know. So I became a Wickland certified, and I put it in quotes because it was, of course, not nationally accredited certification, but we are, our field is fraught with these certifications. It was a wonderful certification, and I learned a great deal from her. So that is my my journey. And then I just created, the, you know, I learned about the voice team from Lita and Karen at that time and continue to um, collaborate. And I learn every single week. I could not do this work without the voice team, without a doubt. The further I get into this field, the less I feel that I know. And I just could not begin to do my work without constantly talking to Julie Rosenzweig in particular, um, my main collaborator, uh, speech language pathologist. So that is my path. So let us go, let us back up just a little now. And uh, Peggy is going to give us a bit of a history about the speech, oh, sorry, about the singing voice specialist. Thank you, Kari. One of the interesting things to me is how many people don't know what the term singing voice specialist refers to. Um, in 1981, Dr. Bob Sadaloff, Robert Sadaloff, coined the phrase singing voice specialist as a member of what he has had established as a voice team. And loosely defined at that time, singing voice specialist was a singing teacher with specialized training that um, qualified them, he, him or her, to work with an injured voice in collaboration with a medical voice team or physician and or physician. Um, but historically, 
the relationship between singing teachers and laryngologists has been somewhat informal. When a singer had a vocal injury or a vocal surgery that they needed to recover from, for many years, laryngologists would go to singing teachers to help with that work because singing teachers were the, the individuals with the most knowledge about voice production and uh, exercises to use for efficient voice. What a lot of us don't realize, or I certainly didn't realize when I came into this field, is that the discipline of speech language pathology, and Lita and Marcy can speak to this more authoritatively, only a small portion of it, if at all, is devoted to voice. There are many disciplines that are covered under speech language pathology. So if someone's a speech language pathologist, it does not mean that they're qualified to work with a voice injury. So naturally, laryngologists chose this collaboration with singing teachers in a very informal way. Dr. Sadilov coined the term, decided what it should be. And since that time, more and more people have expressed an interest in going into this area of, of study and, and career opportunity. What we're faced with today is that there is not really a codified, recognized system of accreditation or licensure for someone who wants to become a singing voice specialist. And I'm sure as a group we'll talk about that uh, more completely. There are different routes to learn what you need to know. One of the things I'd like us to talk about tonight is, and I sort of made a little list, I'd love to to talk about the title itself, Singing Voice Specialist, and how confusing that title is just by the very use of those words. I'd love for us to talk about what, you, what each of us believes should be the training protocol included in the background of someone who wants to safely and effectively work with the injured voice. That's something we can all weigh in on. We can certainly talk and, and take questions about career opportunities in this field. So I, I love the fact that the four of us are here. It, we, we have a lot of, of sort of institutional knowledge about this field that I hope we can share. There's so much interest. Um, the last few years I was in Dr. Sadloff's office, I mean, I'm sure we all do. I would receive, oh, I don't know, 10 calls a month from singing teachers wanting to become singing voice specialists. And all these years and we still don't have a good answer for it. So hopefully we'll at least educate people about where we are in this evolving process. We have to remember that um, Western medicine in general is evolving at an exponential rate and voice medicine, particularly as a subspecialty, is exploding. And along with that comes the understanding of the need for good voice clinicians to improve patient outcomes. So there's more and more need for folks who do this, and we've got to at some point settle on the training protocols, and that's what I'm going to say right now. Wonderful. Thank you for that, that important history, Peggy. Let's, let's take those two points, those two nuggets you've uh, lobbied to us. Let's talk about the term for just a moment. I don't think we need to belabor it. It seems to be the term that's being used uh, even across the pond. You know, it's it's uh, to some degree what we're using. So I think all of us, I, I, I believe I first heard Ingo say, shouldn't anybody who's a singing teacher be a singing voice specialist? So I think that's where the objection comes into singing voice special specialist. If we went to singing voice rehabilitation specialist, um, then there's going to be objection to the, the term rehab, which we will talk at some point tonight, um, I, I believe. So some people have talked about singing health specialists. And I would also say with that though, even in the last decade, singing teachers are so much more knowledgeable about, about vocal health as just a baseline of understanding. So again, shouldn't any singing teacher have knowledge of singing health? So it, that's where I'll stop. Marcy and Lito, would you like to share your thoughts about the term? I'm, I'm sure I'm happy to jump in. I, I agree. It's a very non-specific term. And I think one of the issues with how non-specific it is, aside from the obvious that voice teachers are obviously uh, singing voice specialists and as often the gatekeepers of the vocal health of their students and the first window into that pathway, 
clearly they should be also uh, very knowledgeable in vocal health. But I think even more troublesome is that the consumer slash singer uh, slash patient, whatever they are, doesn't have any idea what that means. Just because somebody's calling themselves a singing voice specialist doesn't mean it's Kari Ray or Peggy Baruti, you know. So I think it's even more troubling that the that the standard singer has no idea uh, what that means. So not only do we have to figure out, and I know that we've, and maybe Lita, you can talk more about the term sort of clinical singing voice specialist versus an independent singing voice specialist, Kari, like you are right now. Uh, which I think is at least helpful, but I, I still don't think it solves the problem to really describe what it what it is. Before we go further, I just want to throw in one idea, and that that is that the idea of terminology has to do with accepted definition. And within the medical voice medicine world, the term singing voice specialist has come to represent over the last 25 or 30 years this singing teacher with this specialized training. Now we're moving out of that model and we're looking for a better term. But but by definition, that has been understanding within the voice medicine field for sure. But that doesn't mean we don't need a better term. At Lita, I'm sorry, I just jumped in. No, no, yeah, I just concur with uh, everything that's been said so far. It's hard, it's hard. Um, you know, I think there was a, a a specific intention of Dr. Sadloff in coining that term um, and you know putting that language around it that you know included in-depth understanding of of the science of singing and the and the clinical aspects of it. Um, and it's challenging because there's not a given body that can confer that title onto someone. So I think that's that's part of what's difficult about it is um, that it's, I mean, it's kind of available to, to anybody to sort of determine if they feel like they they, they fit that definition. Um, certainly people here, Peggy and Kari, you're just so many years and years and years of uh, hard work and study that have gone into building that piece of the definition for you, right? The the understanding of the clinical and the scientific aspects of it. So, um, yep, evolving term. Uh, we need to keep <laughs> having these discussions. You know, I feel like every time we discuss it, you know, so there's some, you know, a little aspect of clarity uh, that comes into it. Um, just, just picking up on what was said earlier about the kind of exponential growth of the profession. I mean, really, until the 90s, there wasn't even a fellowship in laryngology. So um, right. it's it is a it's a a new specialty, new-ish specialty within the field of otolaryngology, and a new-ish specialty considering how many hundreds of years we have of singing and training singing. A uh, new specialty within that realm as well, and these conversations are hard and they're gnarly. And um, uh, what was the word that you used, Kari? That you have? Uh, it wasn't. Was it spunker? What, what scrappy. was the word? That, scrappy. Well, scrappy. What? Scrappy. 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 Yeah, that's, that's a perfect. <laughs> I think that that is at the top of the list of requirements for uh, <laughs> scrappiness. Um, it's perfect. It's perfect. Um, but um, I, I think it's it's important as we're in this evolution, which is a good thing, which is an exciting thing. I just want to underscore: it's hard. That you know, these conversations are challenging. That it's challenging to figure out um, the pathway. But it's exciting to be part of an evolving profession and an evolving uh, career path. Um, so I, I think. In terms of kind of where we go from here, it's just it's just important for people to understand what they should ex what they can reasonably expect from the training path that they're in, um, and uh, to to really have a, a, an accurate idea of um, what their what their expectations should be. And I mean that on both ends of the spectrum. So you know, as you said about speech pathology. Yeah, I mean, when I got my master's, voice disorders was a required course, and it was, you know, a three-credit course. 
since then, I, I think in a lot of programs, it's an elective at this point. So there are mm -hmm. speech pathologists who may be coming out of their training with no exposure to voice disorders. So um, it's really important for that person to understand what, you know, what their uh, kind of what their framework is if they're presented with a, a, a patient who has a voice disorder, let alone a singer who has a voice disorder. Um, and then also kind of what are the, the expectations <laughs> on, the, on the vocal pedagogy end as well. You know, it's... I it, uh, 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 no. Peggy, you go. Peggy, please go. I was just, just uh, Lita triggered a thought for me when I first went to work for Dr. Sadilov, which was back in 1991, it was at a time when his speech pathologists were somewhat trained in voice, and I had a lot of background in voice, but not much background in anatomy, physiology, neuroanatomy, voice disorders, clinical treatment. And what I saw was this sharing of information between myself and the speech pathologists and the physicians. And it's through this collaboration, the sharing of knowledge, that the field has grown. I, I've certainly seen. Um, from the inside, how the world, and I know y'all have too, of speech pathology and the training of speech pathologists in voice has been influenced by what singing teachers know. And I just want to take a moment and say what we all know, and that is that an experienced singing teacher, the ears of an experienced singing teacher, and the toolbox of, of um, knowledge and exercises of an experienced singing teacher, those two things are powerful qualifications for someone who wants to work with injured voice. Dr. Mm -hmm. Sadloff was very fond of saying, we don't have a piece of equipment, scientific equipment to objectively measure voice that's better at detecting subtle mm -hmm. changes in voice quality than the ears of an experienced singing teacher. So singing teachers bring mm -hmm. a lot, a lot to this profession and I see how they have influenced, we have influenced um, mm -hmm. voice and voice care. And our understanding of vocal exercises and vocal, once we are able to hear that, great. Mm -hmm. But the knowledge and understanding of how to design a vocal task within the framework in front of us to in facilitate efficient singing, that's the next critical piece. And that takes years, in my opinion, in the studio, working with lots of different singers uh, at different times to cultivate that understanding. And Cara, you're talking about the need to have experience as a singing teacher with healthy voices. You're talking about the straight up habilitative element of That's working correct. with healthy voices. Yep. That's I right. Yeah. 100%. And, you know, the, the ability the, be, to be able to demonstrate the ability to build technique in a in a healthy instrument is is the basis for for all of this Be, you know before one starts to consider working with a, a singer who has um an injury to be able to to take a singer from their current skill level and enhance that skill level um is is so critical and that's what you're talking about kari about designing an exercise mm -hmm. regimen and Peggy what you're talking about with with your ears which I I concur 100% all the you know the the um, equipment and assessment tools that we have in a clinical setting which are great um, and of course extremely useful but the the one that I could not do without is my ears absolutely yes. and, and just to clarify we, we're not talking about diagnosing a voice problem that is not the purview of anyone except a licensed laryngologist. What we're talking about is hearing the subtle changes that represent what is going on with voice. And that is what a good voice teacher can do. And it's priceless. And what I would add to that also is that over the last 25, 30 years, this pedagogy also has evolved to a more functionally based biomechanical yep. And also the understanding of what different, different vocal styles require. I think that that is also another thing that the experienced singing teacher um, who wants to be working in this realm needs to have an understanding of all of those different types of singing and, and the differences biomechanically of what's happening in the needs of those singers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
in a healthy state, let alone when they're injured. Um, injured right. so the other thing I would well, say before we is that graduates, ahead, history, if, they, if they even cover singing in the voice disorders class, I, I didn't have singing in my voice disorders class, Lita, and I don't know that you did either, but if you go to some universities where there's a strong focus there and you're lucky enough to get that, but the, but that's gonna be spotty, what kind of education you're gonna get in a graduate program of speech pathology right. voice and singing voice. Right. And, and that's another sticky wicket, isn't it? Because should someone who has not been a singer, but has gone through a speech path program and learned to work with voice disorders and knows something about voice, should they be working with the singing voice? I mean, my opinion is no, but I, I, yeah, anybody I don't else? Have the kind that's, of background. That's my, that's they my can work opinion. with the speaking voice, but not the singing voice. I don't, I, I agree with that. I agree. All right, do you? Uh, yes, uh, are you asking um, Mina speech, somebody who's got the speech pathology degree? With no singing And maybe background. has a, with and no, understands oh, how to work with the disordered speaking voice, okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course, and, and I would even, um, and I'm not sure if we wanna go this far into this weed yet, but you know, even the, the person that has a, maybe a bachelor's in vocal performance has done some mild performing, decided pretty quickly to go back and get their speech pathology degree, um, maybe has never taught voice non-disordered, right? So the, the question is, at what point do, are they feeling qualified to work with the singing voice? Uh, and disordered. But I want to put a pin in that because that's going to lead us down so many other rabbit holes. So we will come back to that. I want to come back just for a minute, Peggy, to the questions you posed to us 10 minutes ago. <laughs> and I, I want to add two things about the term. One the thing about the term is I've often thought there should be a designation like uh, SVS voice teacher and an SVS SLP. And I oftentimes have designated that because I think that as as we've talked about this gray area where mm -hmm. we interlap and so when I write about it that's how I always say it, SVS voice teacher SVS SLP and I've thought that for a long time that there needs to be this uh -huh. designation and then we can continue not tonight but to get clearer on this gray area that is happening in a clinic or in an independent studio so that's been my thought but Peggy you also asked us and I think let's at the somewhat at the beginning here um you mentioned what is required what are the requirements let's go there now before we go further into the weeds and yeah, whoever wants to go ahead i'll go <laughs> please do i have a list i have a list i'm just gonna read this list because i think i talk about it all the time and i'm sure everybody <laughs> and this is just my opinion this is just my personal opinion only um that the individual who wants to become a singing voice specialist should have at least an undergraduate degree in vocal performance and or pedagogy, a number of years experience as a singing teacher. I don't know how we arbitrarily decide how many years, because you can find somebody who's taught for 10 years that not very good and other people that have taught for six or seven and they're terrific, but a number of years of experience as a teaching uh, singing teacher professional performance experience because you are going to be working with professional performers and people who are either semi-professional or fully professional and you need to understand what that world is really really like i think it's important the individual needs to have completed coursework in vocal anatomy and physiology neuroanatomy of the voice voice disorders and voice measurement and assessment equipment the individual needs a basic understanding of the principles um, of laryngology and current treatment modalities, including medications and surgical interventions. I think a singing voice specialist needs a fundamental understanding of the principles and practices of voice specialized speech language pathology. And I think the individual needs a substantial amount of time in observation of the interaction between laryngologists singing voice specialists and speech language pathologists with their patients. And on top of all of it, there should be a number of clinical hours of mentored supervision of, of work with injured voice by an experienced clinician su a supervisor. So those are the things that I think ideally should be in place. Are they always? No, but should they be? That's what I think. 
No, that's it's it. a long mm-hmm. list. Somebody else. I, it, but you look at those things individually or coll- collectively, it, you know, it's a long list. And I just want to say, I think the m- most critical part of any singing teacher that, that we in our field are trying to gain is that practicum piece. You know, the SLP has a fellowship. Most fields teaching have a fellowship many psychology, many fields have this and we don't. Now Nats has their mentorship program now going. Shannon Coates and I both offer practicums and I think um, Amelia Rawlings and others, sorry if I've left some of you off, forgive me. Um, But this practicum piece is critical, I think. And I'm even doing a practicum for SVSs that's for the singing teacher though, specifically. So that of your list, Peggy, is the one that makes, you know, Many voice teachers are now going and getting anatomy, physiology, acoustics, cognition of the voice training, Mm -hmm. but that piece of bringing it together and how do we teach that is critical. Marcy or Lita, I'm sure you would like to comment. I would add to that wonderful and very well thought out list it within the anatomy physiology piece and the and the lots of mentorship and observation within a clinical setting that there really is a, an emphasis that the laryngologist and or speech pathologist is really uh, talking to the person trying to get this training, whether it's a speech pathologist or a voice teacher, about vibratory function of the vocal folds and how various different pathologies impact vibratory function of the vocal folds and how that translates into the balance of, of you know, source filter, breath source filter, and and though that very specific, and then what that looks like in an in an actual exercise, mm-hmm. actual in an actual practical setting of how to deal with that issue. I, I, you are so right about that. I often tell people being a singing voice specialist is not rocket science, but you have got to understand the, the physiologic nature of a vocal problem in order to decide what you are and aren't going to do. And if you don't understand that, you shouldn't be doing it. Is that what you're yeah. saying? Yeah, and what it looks like in an actual, because understanding it and looking at it on a on a on a strobe and having a laryngologist describe it, and and understanding on on this level, and at, and then having a, somebody in front of you with with scarring or something and understanding mm-hmm. what to actually do and how to guide that process. Mm-hmm. Those exactly. are very right. So. That specificity is key, I think, to success. Lita, please say something. Yeah, a hundred percent agree. And Peggy, thank you for that just thorough and well thought out list that I know is from your own experience um, for many years. And Marcy, yeah, I, I feel the same way that that, you know, be kind of beyond anatomy and beyond being able to look and recognize a, a certain uh, lesion, um, just having that deep differential understanding of the, the impact on um, how the voice functions. I guess it's hard here. Now I'm at the end. I got to think of what to add to this list. I'm going to put scrappiness on it just because I really (laughs) am am adoring that so much. Um, It's going to follow me now, I fear. It it is you, Kari, and it is is at the top of the list of many things I love about you so much. Um, Maybe I would add to that um, some training and understanding of ethics, uh, which is a thing that I think is not, um, I know that we in Nats uh, have a code of ethics, um, but I, I, that that's certainly not something that I, I was taught in my preparation as a singing teacher, uh, and I think it's important mm-hmm. in, in this yeah. work. And then also that the, the pedagogical abil- abilities need to span styles um, and and really understand right. and be able to right. uh, to to teach in a in a style specific way um, and then just want to say I, I really like what you said Kari about the SVS singing teacher and SVS I SLP I think that's a really nice I said that years uh, ago I yeah, yeah I, I I think it's a really nice branching of the original uh-huh. uh, definition that that's that's <laughs> functional and meaningful thank you for that and it's it's it very would be clarified. easier to the, and it 
would be easier for us to then get into the weeds of the gray area. I agree. Because, mm -hmm. you know, although we all have um, legal ramifications that I, and ethical that we need to be aware of, as singing teachers, in some ways, it's more self-imposed, right? Um, because we are not licensed. So th there's a difference between that. And I, and I think there is a difference between our, our skills, regardless of the background with which we bring to this work. If you're in a clinic 40 hours, 35 hours a week, working speech and then as, as an SVS, what does that look like versus I'm full time in the voice studio working with singers voices and I should not be working on speech with them. That is not my scope of practice. So um, I think that would be a, a great uh, clarification there. I want to, um, before we lose uh, with all these, there's a bunch of questions coming in. Ian asks, given the wide range of singing skills and potential for professional success accommodates by BM and MM degrees in voice, how does someone in this position to hire such a person into either a SES position or SLP professional voice position? Evaluate what level those skills should be at. Is it more of a baseline that must mm. be supplemented or do we assume a certain skill set? I can tell you what happened in Dr. Sadlow's office. I could volunteer that because um, in my experience, the people who the, the people who were hired um, after a certain point, basically uh, Dr. Sadlow was looking for um, voice clinicians who were licensed speech language pathologists, but also had been experienced singers and singing teachers. He had already stepped to that place. Um, but once they came in, he wanted some observation of their teaching skills with regard to singing. And that became partially my responsibility. So that was a bit of oversight or a bit of a way of looking at it. Um, I don't know that there's a way to, there's not a standardized way to evaluate that that I know of. Lita, do you deal with that in your situation? Yeah, I don't know if there's a standardized way, but that's a policy that we also file, uh, follow mm -hmm. when we're, we're hiring SLPs who are going to work with singers. I mean, we first have winnowed them down based on, you know, their experience on paper, but we don't really know a lot from, from what's on paper. So right. uh, we always have them as a part of their interview process demonstrate their mm. offsite, right. so not right. working, not working with a uh, a patient, not working with a singer mm. who has a voice injury, um, but with a uh, you know a a a a voice student, have them kind of dem like you would in a in an academic setting if you were hiring somebody mm -hmm. to do voice, right. kind of the same. It looks very similar to that. I think that there is an otherness factor that cannot translate onto paper. Um, I think that there is a quality that someone who's going to do this really, what I, I mean, I really consider it to be sacred work when you're working with an injured voice and certainly someone who's an injured singer. And I think that there is an otherness factor that is just that intuitive internal knowing of how to interact with someone and their voice based on your experience, you know, all sorts of factors play in that doesn't necessarily translate when you're bringing someone in as a new hire and looking at their CV and, you know, mm -hmm. they ship here. And I, I just don't know that you can necessarily predict that, you know. It's a really good question and it's hard. I love we're using the term evolving field because that means we don't have to have an absolute answer necessarily. But that's a great question. You know, we've been using, because in my uh, presentation that I sent you all that I presented in 2011 before PAVA became PAVA called the Apologetics of the Singing Voice Specialist. And back then I said, it's an evolving field. And I thought I was late to the party then. We're now 10 years <laughs> later. Like, when are we going to evolve and, and how? And yes, which maybe brings me, let me keep going. I'm still on page one of our outline. <laughs> but wait a minute, wait a minute. We don't want to stop. Wait, wait, wait. We don't want to stop evolving. We want to be lifetime no. learners that are continuously evolving. But I know we have to have some standards. I mean, sometime, someplace, somehow, we've got to establish some protocols or standards for this training. What I'm referring to, of course, Peggy. And Marcy yesterday used a great analogy with me about, what did you say, railroad, um, 
uh, right the you know so, yeah if there's a speech pathologist who you know so i had to invent my own wheel lita had to invent your you were lucky enough to actually have a voice focused um cfy it sounds like um, but most of us had to invent our own wheels so you know if at the end of the day those of us who do this work can can come up with guardrails for the younger professional who does want to enter into this whether they're entering it from a, a voice uh, teacher direction or from a speech pathologist who wants to do this work it doesn't matter uh, the both are going to require um, uh, some kind of filling in and training and i and uh, the, ideally what we would do with this practice this dream practicum is is to just set up those guardrails for those professionals who want to be doing this so that there is some sort of a standardization of how one goes about getting this information that they're not going to get in, in grad school let me i want to um just give this list that will give us a segue into we keep mentioning pava but there are perhaps people that don't know so i just would like to say um that in with regard to the voice team voice team voice team right we all agree that the voice team is imperative i want to say a couple things the voice team can extend beyond the laryngologist the speech language pathologist the voice teacher it can right include physical therapists massage specialists psychologists neurologists allergists pulmonologists naturopath acting voice specialist we could go on and on dentist did i say that right so um so i do want us to think broadly and as lita reminded us all the other night the most important person in the voice team is the singer the client the patient right so that is that yeah. is must be at the forefront um and i i would like to come back to that just a little bit about this um imperative nature of the voice team but let's say the multidisciplinary conferences i do want people to know about of course the voice foundation thank you again for co-sponsoring tonight the Fall Voice Conference, which is fabulous. It will be in San Francisco next October. Um, uh, the Self Plug Northwest Voice Conference, uh, which will be this May 13th and 14th in Seattle, Washington, which is a multidisciplinary conference. Uh, and of course, their Utah Performance Voice Conference just had a, an online one last uh, yesterday. San Francisco has an online, uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't know if it's online this year, but they have a multidisciplinary conference. So there's many more popping popping up beyond even the, the big ones, the Voice Foundation and Fall Voice. Um, but then we we have PAVA now, Pan American Vocology Association. So Marcy or Lita, would you please talk a bit about this wonderful association? Lita, as, <laughs> as the president, please. <laughs> uh, I, I think we have served around equal time. Um, Yes, I, I I have not been on the board for the last year and a half, um, but the the whole idea of and I, I think all of us were present at that birth of that organization, um, and many people in the audience today as well in 2013 at Salt Lake City, um, and the the whole idea was for for that to be um, kind of uh, an opportunity to create a hub. That, is, that has the spokes that go out to all of these um, different professions that, that intersect in this area of voice and uh, specifically singing. Um, so also has an annual conference, which will be in August this year in Minneapolis, which will be a hybrid conference. So hopefully this will be our third annual Minneapolis <laughs> conference and the first one that's actually gonna happen wow. in Minneapolis. Good Lord willing and the creek don't rise. Um, <laughs> and, and part of the impetus for starting that organization was to try to create a um, a credential that a, a, a path that um, people could follow to a credential, which is uh, nearing its um, point of of launching, which will be called the Papa Recognized Vocologist, and I believe Ed Reiser is in the meeting tonight and he really is the person who has uh who has taken this over the finish line um and the idea is that that is not a credential that is qualifying anyone to do anything so it's not qualifying somebody to teach singing it's not qualifying somebody to 
um, provide medical care to a singer. It's not qualifying anybody to do singing voice rehabilitation. The idea is that it, the collection of experience, training, and uh, knowledge um, that is measured through a presentation of a portfolio of training and experience and knowledge um, through a test. Multidisciplinary, yeah. So multidis you have to demonstrate multidisciplinary um, interactions in addition to the written test, yeah. It's been many years in the making. We're almost there. <laughs> Ed Mark, is our you are still on that committee, right? On the committee, yes. And Ed Reisert is the chair of that committee. Um, mm -hmm. Met Ken Bozeman, Mary mm -hmm. Sandage, and Troy Campbell are the other, and Emil and Amanda um, is the other one on there. So yeah, we have fun. We're almost there. <laughs> um, uh, somebody has asked, and this is an app time. What is the difference between a vocologist and a singing voice specialist? Could I could I give Ingo's definition, his original definition of vocologist? Ingo yes, Tisa long advocate has long advocated for formal, recognized, and codified systems of training for singing teachers as well as those who work with injured voices. He's long been a proponent of this. His term vocology, which he defined as quote, the science of voice habilitation and the treatment of voice disorders, end quote, has led to the term vocologist, now widely used to self-identify by many individuals uh, involved in various aspects of voice training, voice care, and voice research. Now, those of you in PABA, if you have, could, could we just for a second look at the definition of habilitation and rehabilitation? Because I think, I think that's confusing for people as well. Don't you think? Just just very briefly, and, and in that sentence, Ingo actually refers to both, but the distinction between habilitation and rehabilitation, habilitation refers to the process of training and strengthening the healthy voice to meet specific performance demands. This describes just typical speech and singing lessons for the uninjured voice. Rehabilitation refers to restoring what has been damaged to its former condition and function. Subsequently, in, in our field, I mean, I can't use the word rehabilitation because that is really the purview of people who are licensed. Same thing with the word therapy. So habilitation, working with regular healthy voices, rehabilitation, bringing something back from an injury. And in Ingo's original statement, he referred to vocologists as Vocology is working with a healthy voice habilitation, and it sounds like rehabilitation. But now it seems like a very broad term, vocologist. That's all I know about that. It has become Somebody broad. Else. And I would say on the topic of habilitation versus rehabilitation, I think that when we talk about, so Lee and I, who are on the, the cl clinical speech pathology mm -hmm. end of this, when we have a singer and we're working with a singer, it, and I know she and I have discussed it, so I know we're on the on on a similar page. It is about restoring function for their daily needs. And if they are a singer, whether they are a vocational singer or um, the the prayer leader in their church or singing on the Metropolitan Opera or national tour, th that is what their daily function requirements are for their voice. So the role. The way we view the role as the speech pathologist in that setting with the backgrounds that we have is to get them to that point. And the, the historical distinction of speech pathology is speech, um, a speech only kind of silo, I think is, I mean, I, for the, in the world I live in and the clinicians I interact with, it's really more about the the subsystems, balancing, balancing subsystems uh, and not so much speech versus singing. So when we're looking at a patient based on what, what their needs are, it's really how biomechanically can we get them more intact within the setting of whatever their vocal injury is to get them performing at the level that they need to be performing reproducibly, sustainably without fatigue. Um, you know, so that that old distinction of like speech pathology, speech, I don't, I, I don't know that that's how it's viewed anymore. In, in but, our, you're not, I, but you're not suggesting that a speech pathologist with no background in singing should be working with 
Absolutely. That's not what you mean. So maybe Kari's definition is what applies here, that you I, are an SLP yeah. SVS. I feel just I as love Marcy's pathologist I, I, doing this work um, ha absolutely needs to do the same amount of due diligence that Kari did in order to align herself with Al Marati and his teams to 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 be on their medical care team. I don't I don't think that having a license and a hat that says speech pathologist on it enables somebody to work with an injured singer. I absolutely don't. Um, having said that, I am very comfortable working with injured singers. I I I very comfortably cross cross that line and I when I'm working with a singer I'm restoring their function for whatever their daily needs are but I do it in collaboration I don't you know and that's where that gray area that we were talking about Kari yesterday that sort of that gray area of acute injury rehabilitation transitional and then full function and there's that gray area that we kind of meet the pathologist enters it from this direction and a singing teacher might hit that gray area from this direction if they have a singer in their studio who seems to be getting into trouble and it's what do we do in that gray area um what's the referral pattern who does what who does yeah. what who do i who, who am i interacting with am i calling kari and saying i'm sending you this patient are we working with with the patient in tandem you know i i think there are a lot there are all, all sorts of avenues to it i let and i um want want to make a clear point that i forgot to make at the very beginning that you just reminded me of Marcy. I work in affiliation with Dr. Marathi and Dr. Bott and Dr. Giliberto's team and actually other laryngologists in the area. We have nine or 10 now in the Seattle area. Um, I do not work on site like Peggy did. And that's why I was saying at the beginning that I probably represent more of the what will be the future of voice teachers who uh -huh. want to be SVS is you have to create Absolutely. this collaboration. You have to contact the laryngologist in your area, not the ENT people. If it is an ENT, they must be a voice specialist. Even a lot among laryngologists, though, please understand that not all of them specialize in the performing voice. Even among the specialty, there is a subspecialty of this specialty of the broader field. So I digress. But um, so I just want to make it clear, I am not on site with them, I, but I have been given permission to say that I work in affiliation with them. The other thing, Marcy, that I want to say is that um, I love this idea that you presented to us Tuesday that you and, and I believe Lita as well think about the voice as just restoring function. It, it's not distinguished as much between singing and speaking. So therefore, this this title of speech language pathologist, I don't know, maybe you all need to talk to Asha about <laughs> uh, broadening that um, description because that adds to the confusion. And then finally, one other thing I wanted to say to what Peggy said that's really important to me. Peggy, I, I approach this idea of rehabilitation terminology a little differently now. It took me a long time to get there. I actually do say that I rehabilitate voices and this is why um, the definition of rehabilitation, I am not a licensed therapist, I am not a voice therapist, I am not licensed. But when you look at the definition, I absolutely am part of the team of restoring function. So why should I not be able to say that I do rehabilitation as a non-licensed person? So that distinction again, SVS voice mm -hmm. teacher. And, and it took me a long time um, to feel that I could say that. Peggy, go ahead, I, would, I can tell. I would, oh, no, I was just gonna say what we, what we do is rehabilitative. The dilemma oh. that I face is working in an mm -hmm. office of that level, full time, a medical office where uh, the legal implications of what you put in a report are significant. And so we really had Got to follow it. the letter of the law with regard to yes terminology and the use of the word habilitation of therapy. I think Got it. Thank you. Kari, transparency is the other issue. When you say rehabilitation, mm -hmm. it's very transparent that you have an affiliation with a right. team, not just carelessly putting up on your uh, website that you're that you rehabilitate or do voice therapy mm -hmm. as we see in many cases. So I think it's I think it's different because you're you are you've done the work and you're very transparent about what your role is and your affiliation with a top class, world class voice care team in your area. So, well, and we need to, you know, since this is a Nats chat, you know, my my 
standpoint has always been, I'm so respectful, as you all know, about our scope of practice and the voice team. I just, I can't stress that enough. And yet, we have singers all over the country. And if the number 30% is accurate, I heard that statistic years ago. I don't know if it's true. At some point, we'll have a, an injury at some point or a disorder in their, in their lives. And it doesn't matter to me if it's an elite singer or the church singer who's 65 and has been singing all of her life, as I said earlier today, and has been diagnosed with a voice tremor. It is just as important to them. So how do we get this information to singing teachers who are going to be, whether we, whether we, I mean the big we, not the four of us, anoint, right? Uh, the gatekeepers, whether we say, yes, you can now call yourself an SVS, right? There's no one doing that, nor sh should there be at this point. So how do we make certain that people feel welcome to this and that we acknowledge, this is the key, that we acknowledge that not everybody is going to live in a place where they can get to a key team and yet they need help. Mm -hmm. You know, that that's, but I guess I would say to every NATS member, every voice teacher out there, that you, you really cannot do this work without communication. You don't have to work regularly with the voice team, but if you have a particular singer, you have to be in communication with the SLP and uh, the MD on a regular basis. So anyway, somebody else speak. <laughs> well, I, I do think that we are, I do think we are helping, trying to help people understand what a singing voice specialist is and that if you want to do it, these are the things you really ought to do to train yourself to do it effectively. Anybody can hang up a shingle and call themselves a voice teacher, we know that. But the risk for injury, and, and any voice misguided voice teacher or someone who makes a mistake can hurt a healthy voice. But when you're dealing with an injured voice, the voice, the, the voice itself is more vulnerable to, to further injury. So there are, there are ethical and legal repercussions to that. So if you're going to call yourself a singing voice specialist and work with diagnosed injuries, we're telling people tonight the things that we agree should be part of your training. And these things are acquirable. It is possible to get this coursework. It is possible to teach for five or 10 years and to study under, under other teachers and to go to NATS meetings and learn different techniques and be a lifelong learner. These things are possible. They're not easy, but they're possible. That's what we can do, and I think that's what we are doing. And you can't sure. like us, and you, and you, I mean, Ilita, I know you and I both, I just had somebody fly in from Oklahoma uh, last week to observe in our clinic, and right. she did right. any kind of two or three day as part of her sabbatical. So, I mean, there are, there are, if, if you're wanting to see the clinical side, there are certainly clinicians who I think are open to to doing that I am one of them on the right in, in the right mm -hmm. set, right circumstances the other thing we should say is that the things we're talking about are are specific to the United States which mm -hmm. is probably mm -hmm. yep. 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 Hey, they have a different model and there 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 are things that are that are different in other countries so I just wanted to put that on the table so we're talking about U.S. when we talk about um mm -hmm. that's true Lita, oh, well, Lita, Lita go I was just going to ask Lita, but I was going to ask a read somebody's question, but Lita, I I want to give you room to respond to that monotony of information that we've just all shared. Oh, far from the opposite of monotony. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> engaging and important and and uh, and necessary. So all such important things. I guess I just would encourage folks who are in the audience and tonight or or who watch this later um that if you're embarking on this path be sure to talk to people who are doing this work about what's what's the optimal path for what you want to do and the path is not decided as is abundantly clear from this discussion tonight um and it's you know there's not a one one route to it, but um, I I have a number of times had um, conversations with folks after they have already kind of embarked on on um, a training path. Who said to me, "If I had known what to expect, I would have chosen a, a different path." Um, and kind of from both 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 ends of 
the spectrum that has happened. So um, more and more in the clinical setting, and whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, it just kind of is, is the way it is. More and more in the clinical setting, there are people out there who are kind of taking on this dual training path of having a, a, a strong background in performance and vocal pedagogy and going on that um, SLP training path. And from the perspective of the healthcare system, if there's a, a job opening in a clinic, that's gonna be very attractive because that person can bill insurance and can address the voice holistically kind of all, all at one time without having um, kind of seeing, seeing separate providers. And, you know, we could have, you know, this, this conversation, maybe part four or five could be, you know, whether or not that's, that's, <laughs> that's a, an optimal outcome, but it is a reality. And so I have had folks who have gone through, you know, a, um, a certification or a, or a um, you know, an academic program that they felt was going to prepare them to work in a clinic. And then they later um, found that, that that model that, that Peggy uh, trailblazed for us is, is quite rare in this day and age of having a singing yeah. teacher, um, yes. and, you know, employed Absolutely. by a clinic. Um, and, and, um, so I just, I just, I feel like it's incumbent on, 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 on me to, and, and on all of us really to, to be clear about that and just to encourage people, you know, if you're going to go on this path, talk, talk to lots of folks. I'm happy, you know, I'm happy to answer questions, have discussions, have folks come and visit at our, our clinic. Um, but just be clear about what, what you should expect from that path that you're pursuing. We have a terrific question uh, from Lauren O'Neill who says, I am a licensed SLP working in an ENT office and often get referrals for patients with voice injuries who are also singers. I am not a trained singer, which I inform my patients at the initial evaluation. And so I am solely working on their speaking voice if that is effective. So my question is, would SVS and I be working with these patients concurrently or would I rehab their speaking voice first prior to referring an SVS? Great question. What an awesome question. Great question. In, in Dr. Sadloff's office, it was concurrent. And Always. for me as well, it's concurrent. It depends on say, the case. And I'll say also in his practice, and it still is this way, whether you are a singer or not, you do yeah. speech and singing, which when I first went there, I thought, what? And I got to tell you, by the time I left, I understood the value. I really did. I had so many people who were non-singers, never sung in their lives, who said, you know what? The singing part is great and I love it and it's really helped me. And I like the exercises better than the speech exercises, but I'll do them both. I mean, it's, but, but it was concurrent. Sorry. Yeah. Our clinic is with, yeah. I agree concurrent is the best model. And that was, that was in a, in a, in a yeah. And, then again, if it's not somewhere where Marcy and Lita or some of these other major clinics are, you know, that, that have an SLP, SVS on site, um, or an SLP who, um, as the, the questioner asked, um, is not a singer, then hopefully the ENT or whatever the clinic is will find out or singing teachers in the area will find out who the doctors are that might be getting these referrals and begin to create a relationship. I think that's the key for voice teachers is to find the laryngologist or ENT voice specialist in your area and begin to develop a relationship, ask for, ask for time. Or if you have a singer who you think needs to have an evalu a medical evaluation, um, please remember hoarseness is not a sign of reflux. <laughs> I mean, it might be, but it doesn't mean we diagnose it, right? So perhaps a singer needs an about medical evaluation by a uh, an MD. Go with them to the appointment and begin to build a relationship with the doctor so that they know to refer to them. And can I just speak for a moment just to voice teachers who don't want to become singing voice specialists but have students that they refer to? 
specialists. Um, I think it's important that the voice teacher be, or the singing teacher be a part of the process. If a singer has an injury and goes in Thank and you. has surgery or rehabilitative work, our clinic invited, with the permission of the patient, invited the teacher to be there and present and observe what was done. And, and so that the, when the singer, the, especially when the singer goes back to the habilitative process fully, um, it's, a, it's a more smoothly integrated transition. So I think it's really important that the singing teacher be included in the process, even if they have no interest in becoming a singing voice specialist. I agree with it's that. It's interesting one. how many pe people want to be a singing voice specialist. And I will tell you, it's very oh. slow work. Uh, people need to know it's not, it's not sexy and it's exciting. Not a, it is, yeah, go ahead, Peggy, take that. It's on. not about music. It's not about music. I was going to say mm -hmm. earlier when Lita was talking about expectation, I really try to talk to people about what you really do day to day. It's that slog, build, step by step, fix. It's not about the music. It really no, is very small. structural and systematic and pedantic sometimes and slow and you yes. got to have patience and it takes a, a different kind of emotional and psychological yes, just, yep. understanding. We all need it with, when we're working with singers, but when you're working with an injured singer, it's a whole different ball game. You're dealing with all with the biggest trauma a singer can have in their lives. Mm -hmm. So there's, we're not psychologists, we're not qualified to be, but we are dealing with that elephant in the room. So it's a whole different ball game at a different level of stress. Um, it, it really is. Alan has just reminded me, I love this, to remind our students that we we need to continue to educate our students and our singers to ask mm -hmm. the voice teacher to be included when, yeah. the, when they go see their doctor, yeah. to make sure that they sign the appropriate forms. Marcy, go ahead. Okay, I, every single singer mm -hmm. at the level that comes into my clinic, if I know they have a voice teacher, I always say, if you, if you would like, um, I strongly encourage you to add your teacher to the HIPAA form and then I give an extra card for them to give to the teacher and I, you know, my, it is always my preference to interact with the primary voice teacher because that is the person that knows their voice more than I do and they have valuable insights but I'm often surprised how often I don't, it's not initiated. I'm not, I'm, I don't have the ability to chase down all of the voice teachers of all of my patients, but I will always set up time to have a phone conversation to respond to an email and all that. I'm often surprised at, at, at the times when I, when that doesn't happen um, on the other end, I'm sort of surprised by that. I, I, I get great value in, in interacting with the voice teacher and getting their, their insights and their thoughts on, on their students who they probably sent to us to begin with. Mm. Thank singing you. I love that. Are, singing teachers are on the front line of of discovery of voice issues because very often young singers, especially, have no idea what a vocal injury, how it might manifest. So singing teachers really are invaluable. And and I just want to say that early early intervention in any voice problem is one of the best things that can happen, short of prevention early intervention, and now voice care is at such a level, if you're lucky enough to find a laryngologist who specializes in voice, that the odds are in your favor for a good recovery. If it's an early diagnosis, mm. a correct treatment protocol, the odds are really in your favor, even if you end up having voice surgery. I mean, there's no guarantee, but the paradigm has changed dramatically in the last 33 years. I'm so glad you brought that up, Peggy. When I do, whenever I do any vocal health with it, whether it's a lecture or with a patient, I always yeah. say proactive instead of reactive. Mm -hmm. Be proactive instead Definitely. of reactive. It will always, yeah. always be ahead of the game if you can just be a little proactive about your vocal health. Yeah, I think the problem is though, for so many teachers, you're in a location where there's not someone Who's, and there's not a laryngologist who specializes in voice. And just because somebody has fancy equipment doesn't mean they know what they're looking at. That's the <laughs> other problem we're running into. I mean, no offense, yeah. but you know, some people are That's better true. at diagnosing than others or more sophisticated. And and how do you know that as a teacher? 
That's when you go to the multidisciplinary conferences, it's always so interesting to watch the doctors, uh, you know, see, see something, a video strobe up on the screen and all of them discuss and the different ideas. And so it's, that's always fascinating to me. When, uh, I strongly encourage people to go to the multidisciplinary conference. So, well, ladies, this has been so wonderful. And I think maybe we do need a part two where we get into the gray area, this gray area of the SLP SVS and the voice teacher SVS, and maybe really ha have a, a conversation about how we all see that and um, how others in the profession see that it would be very interesting. And Maybe we can continue to evolve with some guardrails in place um, as we discuss this. And I would just like to say our dear friend Ken Bozeman has said, we'll bring this conversation full circle now about Scrappy. He wants to know, does being a soprano help with scrappiness? Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Most things. Peggy's mezzo though, so. Oh, right, so. I think, I think, I think a mezzo is plenty scrappy. <laughs> Oh Being an SDS requires scrappiness, I guess. Yeah. Anyway, I say to all of us, aren't we lucky to be in this profession? Yes. I consider myself, I mean, I hate to use the word blessed because that's just so overused, but I swear I do feel that it is a privilege. It is to work a privilege. It is a privilege. It really is. I'm 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 thankful every day to me too. The me too. To kind of bring all of my experiences together in a in a way that helps people is just tremendously um humbling and rewarding yep i love that well thank you ladies and everyone just a reminder our last nats chat of the season i can't believe that we're there will be may 15th black american music voice pedagogy what voice teachers should know and it will be Allison Crockett and Trenice Robinson Martin. Oh, so it should yay. be a wonderful, wonderful yay. conversation. So I hope you'll join us May 15th. And to my esteemed guests and friends, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for Carly, your, thank you. Thank your you, kindness. Well, really, you you guys have been such incredible mentors to me all these years. And uh, your kindness and willingness to talk about this and specific cases that I've had that I might need guidance or you've just all been there and I, I greatly appreciate it. So thank you. Good night, everyone, and uh, continue to stay safe and hopefully we'll see you in May and Nats in Chicago, the Nats Conference in Chicago. Good Pava. night, thank you. And Pava, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Good night.